Um, and the other thing I want to mention, assuming all goes off without a hitch, I'll post this to YouTube as well. And I'll post the link to that at the, the blog spot address too. So you should be able to access the presentation file as well as the, the video of this at that location. Um, uh, so I, I wanted to mention a couple thank yous here. Um, the names of the people there, they, for those of you who can remember back, you know, 20, 25 years ago, the first things that I started speaking about were related to emergency freight cars. And um, like it was, that was really where I first started digging into photos and prototype information and such. And these were some of the people who kind of got me started on, on that quest. Um, I also, before I dive into things, because it's mostly going to be a, a, a slide show, um, I wanted to mention a little bit about um, where the United States was at the, the time um, around the, the lead up and the outbreak uh, to World War II. Because um, we, you know, we, we, the world we live in now, we tend to have um, resources aplenty and we don't think about the idea of um, really rationing many things. Although I guess, you know, in a COVID world, the, the um, getting vaccinations up to speed is probably as good as an example as we've had in, in modern times. And for those of you who can remember back to the fuel crisis of the, the early 70s, that's another example. But um, leading up to World War II, we were coming out of the, the depression and there had been um, an actual an, an economic slump after you know the, it by all accounts it appeared we were coming out of the depression but in the the second half of the decade of the 30s there was a, a brief economic slump and the the capacity that that we think of the u.s manufacturing might still hadn't really matured at that point um you look at a location like Sparrows Point, which did so much steel production during World War II, um, there were parts of Sparrows Point that didn't even exist um, at the beginning of the war. So, you know, we, we were really in, a, in a, um, a tremendous growth spurt that was fueled by the war, but much of the capacity that, that we think of, you know, was, was either nascent or didn't exist at the time. So. Um, you know, keeping that in mind, it, it gives you some context. Um, so when the, the kind of the war clouds were coming and then with the, the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, one of the things that the, the government was concerned with was how to allocate what they knew were going to be uh, limited resources. And the, the War Production Board was one of the, the manifestations of that. Um, but you know, we, we think of the War Production Board in terms of new production, but at the same time, um, they were concerned with all facets of um, the effort and how that related to railroads was not just construction of, of new locomotives and, and freight equipment and the like, but they were also heavily involved in how um, resources for repairs were allocated and additionally, what railroads could scrap. Um, and one of the things that I found most interesting was not only the, the, the level of detail they got into in terms of repairs and the, the, um, the, the amount of like the infinitesimal detail they, they pursued around how much steel could be used to repair certain cars, but also um, they, what I found in my research at the Library of Congress was um, they denied almost every um, request to scrap equipment um, in, on any scale, with the exception, uh, I found it humorous, particularly since I, I'm very interested in the New Haven Railroad, um, they allowed the New Haven to scrap those really old 36 foot double sheath boxcars in large numbers, but Pretty much everything else, they um, were forcing the railroads to keep it running. Um, so it, it was interesting to me the the kind of 
how they looked at everything at such a, a focused level. Um, pivoting back to the production side of things, because that's really where um, we think of a lot of what they were doing. Um, and that goes back to the um, approvals for manufacturing of equipment. Um, one of the, th the things obviously was freight cars. And the, there were several designs that um, were presented. Um, one of the interesting things about the, the cars that were produced is um, there were alternates to those where railroads were allowed to, in some instances, put some of their kind of personal stamp on things, which I, I found fascinating. Um, but generally things followed um, existing standards at the time, which at, at that point in time, um, for what we're talking about here was boxcars. And that was primarily the 37 AAR boxcar and the, the modified 1937 AAR boxcar with inside heights of, you know, 10 feet, six inches or, you know, one or two inches below that. Um, and then one other note, and this is a semantical one for me, but um, we as hobbyists refer to all of these designs as war emergency. Um, I have never found any reference to war emergency in the period materials that I've researched. They're called emergency. There's no war in front of it, which certainly makes sense because they were already in the war. They didn't need to identify that. So I just refer to things as emergency. I don't put the, the modifier war in front of it. Um, so with that long winded intro, um, I'm going to jump into some of the prototypes now. Um, this table is here. It lists um, just about all of the, the box cars we're going to cover um, with the exception of the 24 Great Northern Express cars, but I, I do have those covered photographically through here. So this is something you can refer back to. I don't think there's you know much in the way of, of new groundbreaking information, but for some people who've never really heard about these cars or focused on them, um, it's a good reference tool. Um, so uh, the first thing I'm going to do is go through the uh, 10 foot inside, 10 foot six inch inside height cars. And I'll, I'll highlight some of the differences um, because there were some peculiarities for, for many uh, of the railroads. Um, there, there was no one kind of design car for the 10 foot six inside height cars. Um, the, the Alton, as you see here, received 500 cars. Um, they were unusual for the use of these composite doors where you had the, um, the lower door section that you see there, which is from a Youngstown corrugated steel door. And then there was uh, wood for the upper roughly, you know, three, three quarters to 80% of the door. Um, it, it was obviously an expedient to conserve steel any way they could. Um, Looking at the, the car in a, broad, a broader context, it's a Pratt section single sheath car with um, six main panels. And then you have the two end panels at the end that don't have structural diagonal structural members in them. They just have those straps. Um, one kind of interesting thing about almost all of these emergency design cars, um, at the time, AAR cars the, the side sill is not what you see as the tab sections. Those were um, tied into the, the underframe components, but the side sill actually sat above them. And on AAR design cars of the time, beginning with the 32 ARA design car and then continuing to the 37 variants, that side sill angle um, was basically what I call faced outward, meaning that you had the, the portion that was parallel to the top of the rails. And you can see that above the um, tab sections there. And then you have the face of the side sill. And normally on a 37 AAR design car, that would be out at the outer portion of the side um, and then the sheathing, the side sheathing, sheathing would cover it. Here, that leg that uh, is angled upward is actually between the, the backside of the structural members here that, that's on the inside of the car 
and then up against the sheathing board. So it's basically been flipped for this car design. Uh, that's kind of an interesting thing. And then the, the other unusual thing about these, on a, on a normal steel car, you have a corner angle post. Um, and the end of the car wraps around that angle post. And then the portion of the end of the car that's actually in the same plane as the sides um, is all kind of sandwiched up against the, the portion of the sides there and the, the, um, the corner of the ends. What was unusual about these emergency design cars, most of them, is that where the corner uh, of the end wraps around to the side, there's actually a channel wedged in there. And that channel um, has the, the rivet strip that you would see at the, the corners of the cars is riveted to that channel. And then the sheathing boards are riveted to the other uh, leg of that channel. So it's, it's an unusual expedient to arrive at a single sheath design for, for this prototype of car. Um, you, you'll see that a lot, but I wanted to kind of get that out with these first cars here. Um, the other thing about these Alton cars that was interesting is it's, as far as I've seen, it's, um, as I know, it's the earliest use of the Champion Power handbrake, which had the, it's like a Champion Peacock. Katie has a wonderful hand wheel for those um, in, in HO scale. So if this is something you're looking to model, you can do it that way. Um, very quickly after the war, the, the GMNO um, took over the, the Alton and these cars were decorated as you see here in a very simple uh, scheme with just the, the GMNO um, reporting marks. They removed the, the Alton Herald and um, you know, they, they became very plain looking. Um, one interesting thing, this particular car had a superior composite door. As you can see that that bottom section of the composite door is, um, is a flat panel like a superior door. You can also see the repair that's been made to the, um, the wood portion of the door there. Um, Santa Fe um, received um, 340 foot cars, the class BX38. Um, what's interesting um, about these is they were from General American. The, the vast, vast majority of the emergency box cars were from Pullman Standard. So this is um, uh, one of the groups that was not. Um, the Santa Fe cars, you see the diagonal straps in the, the end panels, they actually have flanges on them. So they're, I wouldn't call them full channels, but they have a channel-like um, quality to them. And the Santa Fe was one of the other roads that had composite doors like you see here. Um, one interesting call out, and I'll, I'll quickly go back. If you look at the bolster tabs uh, just above the truck bolsters, Pullman had a very decided um, notched quality to their bolster tabs. And I'll, I'll keep pointing that out as we go through. Um, if you look at this general American built car, the bolster tabs uh, above the trucks there, there's no notches. They're basically a trapezoidal shape without notches. Um, Pullman, that's a very distinctive Pullman standard trait um, that the more you look for it, the more you're aware of it and you, you see it. Um, Here's an excellent view of one of these Santa Fe cars. Many of the cars had um, wood running boards. Um, again, that was uh, another, um, at this point early in the war, that was uh, a way to conserve steel. And they, they, again, they were very precise in terms of the allocation of materials. So anywhere they could cut um, corners, they did. Um, in 1957, the Santa Fe had a program to rebuild um, these cars with steel sides, which you see here. Um, this is the only photo I have uh, of one of these cars. Fortunately, it's interesting because it's a color photo. Um, it also has an improved uh, Youngstown door, as you see there. Uh, Chicago Northwestern received two groups of cars. Um, they had the first group um, numerically came from Pullman Standard. And again, as you see here, they have that notched bolster tab. 
Um, they also had a Viking corrugated steel roof, which um, if you look along the roof line there, you can see the bumps uh, that, that were kind of um, illustrative of, of that roof style. Um, the first portion had Youngstown corrugated steel doors like you see here. Uh, the second group had superior seven panel doors like as you see on this particular car. Um, and then they also received a group from ACNF. Um, these again had that more trapezoidal shaped bolster tab as you see here. Um, they had seven panel superior doors and they came with Murphy rectangular panel roofs. Um, one thing that I, I had written about on my blog that I found very interesting was the, the cars from Pullman, the Chicago Northwestern stenciling for capacity and reporting marks and dimensional data and everything followed the Chicago Northwestern lettering standards. The cars that came from ACF like this one here um, used uh, a type that was not Chicago Northwestern standard for that lettering. Um, if you're interested in that, you can go to my blog and, and look at that. But I found that to be interesting that they had different uh, type for that stenciling. And then in 1963, the Northwestern um, steel sheathed a bunch of these cars. You notice they, they increased the, the width of the door opening to eight feet. And you see that they had to adjust the angle of um, the diagonal structural members on either side of the door to accommodate that wider door opening. <clears throat> um, nickel plate received 200 cars. Uh, you notice these have superior seven panel doors. If you look at that bolster tab closest to um, the photographer in this image, you get a really good view of those notches that I'm talking about on those tabs. Um, these cars had black ends, which clearly visible in this photo as well. Um, there are a couple um, sets of photos that um, were taken of these cars when they were built in, at Michigan City uh, that show this, the car basically constructed with the exception of the sheathing in place and obviously it hasn't been painted and, and lettered at this point, but I, I love this view where you really get a good kind of look at the, the basic skeleton of, of the car. Um, here's also an inside view. And um, you see those lines on either side of the door that indicate um, the load level for certain types of grains. Um, it's also interesting to see the, the back side of the doors. Um, they're, they're very plain on the superior doors. There is a little bit of a, a bead that you can see if you look closely, um, but these, these would be really interesting um, and easily replicated doors if you wanted to do a car with a, um, uh, one of the doors open, you know, since the, the back of the, the door that you could see through would be fairly featureless. And that's not just on an emergency car, that's any car that had superior doors. Here's a good photo of one of these in, in service. Um, again, with, you know, single sheath cars have so much character. The other thing I love about this photo is the adjacent car, it's either a Pennsylvania X25 or X25A, but um, that's a really good illustration of that stair step effect that you saw in the steam era where there were cars of such varying heights. And, um, you know, that's a, a really nice thing to capture uh, in your freight car fleet to have that variety that, you know, as you see up, down, up, down, as you, you look from car to car. Um, in 1964, a uh, hundred of these cars were rebuilt with um, steel sides. And as you see here, a wider door opening. Um, they did end up being um, assigned uh, N&W class numbers when the nickel plate became part of the N&W. Uh, I believe it was mm, 37 was the class number, B37, if I remember off the top of my head. And um, I don't have any photos of them repainted in N&W, although that's, it's, you know, that's not to say that it didn't happen. Here's a color photo of one of these. This is a, a Jim Parker photo. Um, there were, as I mentioned, some um, exceptions for cars that didn't follow the, the standard. The, the Katy um, rebuilt cars in their shops using um, fish belly center sill underframes from refrigerator cars that were built in 1923. Um, 
this is the, the diagram sheet for them. Um, here's a, a builder's photo of this car. And I, I remember when I found this photo, it, it was the one of, I think, two or three railroad photos that this University of Missouri satellite campus had. And it was, you know, it's one of those, if, if you're researching and trying to find something, there are those sort of eureka moments. And I remember um, coming across this photo when they, they didn't really have a railroad photo collection at all, but yet they had this builder's photo it was kind of a, um, a cool thing for me. You see uh, here, you know, the, the sides do look very similar to the, um, the typical emergency box cars we've been looking at here, but because the underframe is, you know, that old refrigerator car frame being recycled, the, uh, the side sills um, are actually kind of typical channel side sills and they're, they're um, with the facing, the flanges facing inward. So it looks, looks more like we'd think of a single sheath car from the, the 20s and 30s. Um, and then here's a, a photo from my collection of, of one of these cars. I believe this is in the, the mid fifties. Uh, it gives you a, a good look at that chrome yellow that the, uh, the Katie painted a lot of their cars uh, from the, the late thirties into the, the forties. Um, you also notice interestingly, the AB valve is located directly under the door opening and there's a little shield in front of it. Um, usually the AB valve was not um, located you know, between the, the cross bearers under the doors for, for fear of getting damaged. Um, that's undoubtedly why they put that little shield in front of it. Um, Northern Pacific was another road that uh, had a modified um, uh, non-standard emergency car. And they also received the largest group of emergency box cars. They had a, a thousand of them. Um, 750 were built by um, the Haskell and Barker plant of, of Pullman Standard, like you see here, they had black ends. Um, the, the most interesting thing, of course, is uh, they had a, a straight channel side sill like you see here. Um, and the, the structural members were oriented in a how rather than a Pratt truss. And there are, um, you know, uh, fewer diagonals uh, on each side compared to the, the standard um, uh, what you would think of as the standard emergency box car. Um, you can see here seven panel superior doors. Um, those are Barber S2 trucks that it's, it's riding on as well. Um, the last 250 cars came from Presteel Car Company. You'll also note that they did not have black ends. They were the, the same freight car color um, all around. These cars were, um, you, and by the way, this is another one of those uh, skeleton photos that I was talking about that, that's pretty cool. Um, you notice the structural members on these cars extend all the way down to the side sills, which is different from most of the other um, emergency box cars you, you see here. Um, here's another view of an inside of the car and there's various markings, um, again, for you know the car, um, the capacity being maxed out before the car was full of specific um, types of grain. Um, these cars lasted a, a, a long time and they were photographed just everywhere. I think um, every photographer you know, who traveled pretty much anywhere who saw one of these thought it was such a rare thing because they were single sheathed. Um, so they, they were photographed in large numbers in the 60s and into the 70s. This is one, um, you see the Monad now has railway in the name and it has a, a replacement superior door that has only six panels, um, which is, is notable. Uh, the Wabash also had um, kind of an, an alternate version. Um, they, the Wabash for most of their box cars of the steel box cars of the 40s, they preferred a, um, a side sill support that ran from bolster to bolster like you see here. So, um, you know, they put their stamp on their cars in that way. You also notice these um, gussets where all of the, the um, vertical and diagonal structural members meet. Um, those are 
a, a Wabash trait um, that you'll see on some other cars. You know, they're very small ones, but these are these are really pronounced. Um, and then the other thing, uh, and it's not incredibly visible in this photo. There was a good article in Mainline Modeler about these cars that you can find um, where the side sill angle met the sheathing. There's actually a um, a diagonal triangular face sort of um, where there's wood nested in that angle and it, it gives it a sort of sloped um, effect at the bottom of the side sheathing where it meets the side sills. As soon as you see it in photos, you'll notice it. Um, the other thing, just kind of a, a little detail note, the Wabash was a big fan like the Missouri Pacific and, and a few other railroads of um, integrated cylinder heads and lever brackets on their brake cylinders. If you look at the rear of the brake cylinder hanging below the kind of the right um, end of the door there, the brake lever, um, you know, there's obviously one on the front on the clevis, but the brake lever is also right in the back of the, the brake cylinder there. It's in, it's integrated into that. Um, so if you're, you're modeling Wabash, um, steel box cars from the 40s, that's something to be aware of. Um, the, the Wabash steel sheath to these cars, um, circa 1960, and it's interesting, they, because of the way the panels on the, the car side were, um, they used um, eight panels per side rather than the more common 10 for, for typical AAR box cars. Um, and they were renumbered into the NJINI uh, 4100, or I'm sorry, 4000 series, as you see here. Um, we're moving now from the uh, 10 foot six nominal inside height cars to the 10 foot inside height cars. Um, most of the single sheathed 10 foot inside height cars were with the um, Southeastern railroads. Um, the Atlanta and West Point, as you see here, received 60 cars. Um, they had Youngstown steel doors, Murphy rectangular panel roofs, which was common to all of these Southeastern cars. Uh, sister of the Atlanta and West Point was the Western Railway of Alabama. Um, again, virtually identical. They used my, minor power handbrakes. Again, you see that kind of trademark notched bolster tab. Um, above the trucks. That was the, another Pullman hallmark that I've mentioned before. Um, Birmingham Southern received 100 cars. Um, I put this one in because I like showing uh, in service more than builders photos. Um, as delivered, the, the emblem had a black background, but as you can see here, when they were repainted, um, they didn't um, include black in the background. Um, you'll also notice the ends are painted black, but it's not a particularly good job really uh, containing where the paint went. Um, Georgia received 100 cars, again, virtually identical to the other ones from the southeastern roads. Uh, and then central of Georgia received uh, 350 cars. The first 100 came from American Car and Foundry. And then the, the last 250 were from Pullman Standard. Again, one of the, the primary ways to distinguish them um, the Pullman cars had those very pronounced tab, um, you know, notches on the bolster tabs, whereas the ACF cars had something that was more trapezoidal. This is a, a Pullman car. What's interesting, if you look at the right hand end of the car there, um, there were some really um, weird arrangements to kind of uh, tie the ends and kind of shore them up. Um, this particular car, you notice it's only on the right end of the car. Um, this is an ACF car, ACF built car. You notice there's just a single um, horizontal strap that runs all the way from the, um, the nearest vertical structural member. And it actually goes and flares out and is attached to the outside of the corner of the end. Um, if you're modeling a car in the 50s, that would be a very interesting uh, thing to recreate with brass and have it kind of bend out and be attached to the outer uh, corner of the end. Um, the Central of Georgia rebuilt these in 61. 
um, and they were assigned to series 310 to 636. You notice they widen the door opening. Um, I mean, at, by this point, the cars bear very, very little resemblance to the, um, the way they were built. Um, Canadian Pacific um, was one of a few roads that received uh, cars with plywood sheeting, as you see here. Uh, this was built by Canadian Car and Foundry. Um, I know Yarmouth Model Works had um, models for these that I think they're going to be rerunning. Um, also of interest are the, the Barber uh, S1 trucks on here with lateral motion devices. Canadian Pacific also received single sheath cars that were um, quite similar to the, the ones used by the Southeastern roads in the United States, as you see here. Uh, again, they had the Barber S1 trucks with lateral motion devices. Um, Great Northern um, received 975 cars that they built in their own shops at St. Cloud. You notice the, the composite doors here. These were the cars with the really um, flamboyant schemes with the, the Empire Orange and they had green and black, um, really, really flashy cars. Um, some of them had uh, composite doors with you know, Youngstown sections, as you see here. Um, I, I put a, a little chart in here that covers not only the emergency, but the post-war Great Northern Plywood um, cars. There were quite a few different ones and they continued to build them uh, into 47, even though the, the emergency period had ended. Here's one of the emergency cars that has a, a superior bottom section. Um, You'll also notice you can see the structural members kind of peeking below the bottom of the side sheathing. Uh, these cars did not follow any um, AAR standard uh, to that point. Um, you can see this car had national um, B trucks as well. And here's one uh, that was repainted in the early um, 50s. Um, with mineral red, uh, the Great Northern had kind of abandoned that orange scheme uh, once these cars were being repainted. Again, this one has a composite door as well. Um, this is a, a kind of a cool photo of them um, applying the, the interior and exterior sheathing boards and lining. Um, I always love photos where you can see the boards nested into the corrugations in the end. Um, they had to nest wood in there so that they could uh, attach the, the lining, the wood lining against the inside of the ends. They had to attach it something. So they nested those wood um, pieces inside the corrugations. And here's a photo of one of the 24 express cars that was also plywood sheathed. Um, there were 999 plywood sheathed cars and car number 2500 was actually an aluminum car. It was an experimental car. Um, there were also 50 foot cars. Um, the Santa Fe had this group here. Um, they're very similar to the, the 40 foot cars. They, you notice the diagonal straps in the, uh, the end panels have that, you know, those little flanges that make them look like channels, composite doors. These cars had um, four cross bearers rather than two. Um, here's a photo of one of them. Um, in the, the mid 50s, they were very quickly um, assigned to hide loading. Um, you know, some of the cars weren't even 10 years old when they were assigned to hide loading. You notice that this particular um, group of cars, cars had transverse mounted reservoirs, as you can see here, which was something that the Santa Fe was fond of, but their 40 foot cars did not have that. Um, here's a, a color photo, one of these cars later on. Uh, I always love, you know, seeing color photos and you can, you really get a sense of how different boards weather differently. And the Pennsylvania built one um, car in their shops. They didn't build any more. Uh, these were based upon the X38 family of cars. Um, kind of an, an interesting feature beyond the composite doors and the Buckeye trucks. Um, the the two diagonal kind of straps in the end panels were actually Z-bars um, as opposed to the more common just flat steel strap or something like the, those very, um, you know, uh, 
simple kind of channel like sections in the Santa Fe cars. Um, that is it for the, uh, the prototype information. Um, one thing I just, you know, that kind of prompted me to um, put this presentation together was that um, I am going to be working up a set of sides for a 10 foot inside height car. So I think that would be something kind of um, cool to, to have to kit bash with um, uh, one of the MWAX or Intermountain um, car bodies to replace the sides on a 37 A or a box car. So I'll keep you posted on that as well. Um, and again, the, the presentation will be posted um, at this link that you see here, prototopics.blogspot.com. And I'll also um, put the video there too, uh, assuming that it goes off without any hitches. Um, and if someone is gonna feed any questions to me, I'm ready for them now. Yep, I'm here, Ted, hold on a sec. All right, going back. All right, first question, was there a truss plate below the reporting marks on the Alton uh, slash GMO cars? Um, we can go back and check that one sec. Uh, Under the light weight. Yeah, right. I see a truss plate uh, tucked against the side sill below the light weight. And there's also a defect card stencil on that small tab between the bolster and the, you know, the, the one by the door. By the way, it, it's worth pointing out also, it, you see to the left of the reporting marks and the capacity that not the Pullman builders stencil, but that kind of um, upright rectangle. Um, Alton, uh, that was their, their paint code information. They would have the location and, and the paint. Um, and it's interesting because that's something that um, GM and O cars that were repainted at X Alton shops had that as well, but you don't see it on GM and O cars repainted in GM and O shops. So kind of a weird quirk. Uh, did the Santa Fe cars also have wider car sheathing boards? Not to my knowledge. I think these were mostly, I mean, I say five and a quarter, they might've been five and an eighth, but um, I can look, um, I believe Model Railroader in like June 1944 had drawings of several of these cars and I think the box car that they had was the Santa Fe so I can um, I can look at that and see if, if, if it's wider. Um, here's a question about Colonel Chet McCoy. Uh, what do we know about him? We seem to be indebted to him for many freight car photos of the late steam era. Um, I don't know of, of a you know biographically about him. I know that the the interesting thing was he served in the military and you can pretty much track um, most of his postings um, based upon <laughs> where photos are taken. He was uh, obviously posted somewhere, probably like Newport, because there were a lot of photos in Providence. He was in North Carolina. He was in San Diego area. Um, he was probably somewhere in Seattle, Tacoma, Bremerton, because he took a lot of photos in Tacoma. So. Uh, it's interesting to see where his postings coincided with the the dates of his photos. Uh, did any other roads beyond the nickel plate have towing loops on the cars? Um, I do not believe so. Um, uh, well, I take that back. Uh, the Wabash might have just, um, but they, since the Wabash cars weren't really standard, I wouldn't, um, so the Wabash did, yeah, the Wabash did use towing loops. So there, there they are. You can see them. They're below those long side sill supports. Okay. Uh, was pressed steel car related to pressed steel car of the UK? I do not know the answer to that. 
don't know, maybe somebody out there does. Uh, there was a comment, I believe it was joint venture between Morris of Oxford and Bud of Philadelphia. Interesting, I didn't know that either. I know Press Steel um, bought Mount Vernon car in 1946, I believe. Uh, were the 50 footers used for any specific types of service or lading? Like probably what would maybe before hides? I don't know why the Santa Fe, because really, I mean, the, the Pensy car was just one. I don't know why the Santa Fe, um, what the um, reason was for that. Somebody else out there may know. I mean, I know they were, uh, you know, during the war, they were using a lot of 50 foot cars for, for hauling parts for manufacturing things like aircraft, but um, I, I don't have a good answer for that. When did the War Production Board, uh, you know, loose, loosen their grip on the restriction of scrapping older equipment? Um, I believe that that coincided roughly with the, the switch back to all steel construction. Um, and, and, you know, there, there's actually been some, some, the question about things that, if you've heard reference to victory cars, I know in the US, cars that were, um, when they returned to all steel construction were, were given kind of the, the moniker victory because, you know, the, the end of the war was in sight and supplies were plentiful enough that they could go back to all steel construction. Okay. Were the competent door upper sections uh, made of plywood, tongue or groove, or did it vary? It varied. Yeah, it was, uh, it was both. I, I think um, the plywood was used mostly on Great Northern. I think the, the Santa Fe and Alton, it was a fairly tight tongue and groove. Okay. Um... Can you point out exactly what you mean by the notched Pullman standard bolster tab? Maybe the sure. Um, let me do this. Uh, let me um, get a good example of one if I can. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna. So if you see that bolster tab. And you notice that it, it goes, it's square, it's, this is a 90 degree angle, and then it angles up here, and then there's another 90 degree angle here. Those are the notches I'm talking about. You also see it here. Um, and by the way, Ryan is right here. Ryan makes resin versions of these. So, um, you know, there, there are parts available and it's, it's, very noticeable once you see it. And I will show you now on the, um, the central of Georgia car here, you notice ACF cars, it's just, there's no notch. It's a tr true trapezoid. Um, and, you know, most just, I'm sure from a tooling perspective, most manufacturers replicate this just because it's a lot easier to do, but um, it is noticeable. Is there an article or a set of blog entries about how closely the inner mountain car matches various prototypes? Um, I don't know. I feel like the the inner mountain most closely resembles um, nickel plate Santa Fe Alton and you know with with slight detail variations here and there that that you could obviously the the thing about the Santa Fe are those those diagonal and uh, you know I'll highlight that here quickly so people make sure that people understand what I'm talking about but you know you can see how they have these these diagonal sections have these little flanges on them um, the, the nickel plate cars were considered the standard um, if there was one. Um, so, you know, if I remember correctly, the, the nickel plate Northwestern Alton cars are the ones that are probably most easily modeled. Okay. Uh, which uh, side exactly were you thinking of doing? 
Uh, so it would be for um, one sec. be for this car, um, this car. So Atlanta, West Point, Western Railway of Alabama, Birmingham, Southern, Georgia, and Central of Georgia. Okay, and those are all 10 foot cars? They are, and I assume the CP is close enough that you could get by using it for that too, or, you know, fairly close. Uh, the diagonal straps channels on the Santa Fe cars looks like they telescope. Were they adjustable? I think maybe they're referring to where it, like the flanges reduces. I, I think that's probably to clear the ladders. As well. Yeah, that's that's yeah to clear. Um, you know, you you don't want someone in safety issue because of that. Um, yeah. and, and on the other end with the full length ladder, you probably need so much clearance to get it by too. And they use the same yeah. on both ends of the car, right? Yeah. By the way, I, you know, I, I talked through it, but I would like to quickly, um, what I was talking about with the end corners, um, if you see here, you can actually see this is the, the corner of the end, and you see that, you know, nice row of rivets. You also see a secondary row of rivets because of the, the angle of this photo. This steel that's visible here that's not black, it's actually the same color as the side, that is actually the leg or flange of a channel. And then there's another flange of a channel that backs up directly against the back of the corner of the end here. And it nested inside there. It'd be a very difficult thing to reproduce on a model, but it's really cool that there's basically this kind of void behind the corner of the end there where that channel nested in there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a comment by Marty McGurk. It says the nickel plate was the version he had the best drawings and photos for, hence the intermountain model. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Thanks, Marty. I think that's it, Ted, for questions. So, All right. Excellent, great presentation. Thanks, take care. All right, is uh, Jim out there?